Good morning for our West Coast attendees and good afternoon for those viewing on the East Coast. Welcome to the third Transformational Speaker Series webinar, which is a partnership between the California Green Academy, Island Press, and the sustainable transportation blog, Transportica. The series is a monthly webinar addressing transformational ideas and innovations in transportation design and delivery. For more information, please visit our website at www.calgreenacademy.org forward slash transformational. During the webinar and for the sake of event acoustics, all attendees will be muted until the conclusion. Attendees may post their questions on Zoom's chat feature and I'll relay these questions to our presenters. If you are joining us via phone, you can send your inquiry to our Twitter handle at transforming TCA. Again, that's at the word transforming and the letters TCA or via email at transformational at calgreenacademy.org. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the series YouTube channel immediately following. Our presenter, presenters today are Dr. Karen Trappenberg Frick, Kate Beck, and Teddy Forsher. Dr. Karen Trappenberg Frick is an associate professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of California, Berkeley. She is also director of the University of California Transportation Center and assistant director of the University of California Transportation Center on Economic Competitiveness in Transportation. Her current research focuses on the politics and implementation of transportation infrastructure. This includes her recent publication on the new San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridges planning and development titled Remaking the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge, a case of shadow boxing with nature by Rutledge Books. And we are very proud to mention that her book is also Transportica's book club selection of the month. Dr. Trappenberg Frick has also published numerous award-winning journal articles on the Tea Party and property rights activists' perspectives on planning and planners' responses. This research has led to uncovering unexpected areas of common ground between activists from across the political spectrum. Prior to her university career, Dr. Trappenberg Frick was a transportation planner and project manager at the San Francisco Bay Area's Metropolitan Transportation Commission for nine years. She worked on a wide range of activities, including the agency's Transportation for Livable Communities program, congestion pricing, transport funding, and legislative analysis. Dr. Trappenberg Frick's doctoral degree in planning is from UC Berkeley. And while attending UCLA, she received a master's degree in planning and an undergraduate degree in sociology. Another presenter is Kate Beck. She has a master's in city planning and master's of public health, both from the University of California, Berkeley. And she works as a policy and program analyst at the UC Berkeley Transportation and Public Health Research Center. She is specifically interested in understanding the ways technology and public policy can address health and safety issues related to transportation for underrepresented communities. And lastly, Teddy for sure is a doctoral student at UC Berkeley's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, investigating the interplay between the rise in shared passenger and goods mobility, the advent of dynamic information and the policies and politics that guide and maintain public rights of way. He currently focuses on the effectiveness and equitability of state regional and local interventions, particularly pricing and redistributed access to infrastructure with respect to sustainability and livability goals. Prior to entering the doctoral program, Teddy received master's degrees in city and regional planning and transportation engineering, also from UC Berkeley, and has worked as a resident engineer for the city and county of San Francisco. Without further ado, please welcome today's presenters. Thank you, Greg. Uh, this is uh, uh, Karen Trappenberg Frick, uh, and I'm here at UC Berkeley with Teddy and Kate, and we are just delighted to participate uh, in this series, and uh, so honored to. And thank you for selecting my book as uh, a book of the month. 
Uh, when I started this research years ago, I was hoping that this book would be of interest not only to researchers, but also to practitioners and elected officials and activists. And so um, I'm, very, I'm very delighted by um, all of this, so thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do, what, what we'll be doing is I'll be giving a presentation related to the book uh, and other research that helps us understand a little bit better the uh, curse and courses of mega projects as they um, make their way through um, uh, planning processes into uh, implementation. I'll then pass the baton over to uh, Kate and Teddy, and they're gonna speak about some specific work uh, that we did in a graduate transportation studio that focuses on the uh, second crossing, um, or what we call the third crossing, uh, which is the new, uh, the discussions about a new uh, bay crossing um, between, San, between the East Bay and West Bay that could be rail or could be other modes. Um, and there's been a lot of a hot discussion on that. So we'll, then they will, um, they will follow me. Um, so let's get started with, with my uh, presentation. Uh, and so the title of this is Learning from Mega Projects that, um, focusing on the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge or the East Span. And I'd like to unpack some key characteristics and talk about how we can confront some of those challenges. Uh, in terms of the construction guide, I'll be giving an overview of mega projects and their key characteristics. Uh, I'll focus on the Bay Bridge and then we'll talk about confronting challenges. Um, this is based on research uh, over the better part of a decade uh, where I interviewed um, over 50 uh, different people involved at all levels of government and lots of activists and others that were involved in the Bay Bridge uh, process. Um, when we think about infrastructure projects or major infrastructure projects, we, we turn them often as mega projects. And these are really high profile projects uh, that are long term uh, and they're often fraught with schedule delays and high costs. And I'm focusing on major projects, but sometimes mini projects can easily become mega. Even just a simple intersection or bus rapid transit stop can be challenging particularly when it's along a state highway. Uh, some examples of, um, in terms of major infrastructure projects are clearly the new Bay Bridge, which we'll talk about, as well as new road and um, rail construction and extensions uh, and other bridges. Um, why it's important to consider mega projects is, uh, particularly in this day and age, is in the context of resiliency planning. Um, we have an urgent need to consider big projects, uh, to think about system redundancies for, um, for uh, evacuation or rebuilding after disaster. Uh, and we also need to really pay attention to the, uh, our aging infrastructure. It's critical to upgrade it. Uh, in those discussions, and, and more broadly, we need to think about um, urban areas um, and the power dynamics that are at play in the decision making um, of who benefits and then who loses or who gets left behind. Um, and really importantly, both for the Bay Bridge and other big projects that we have, they can absorb a lot of time, energy, money, uh, particularly uh, capital and operating. Uh, uh, costs and funding that could potentially go to other projects. And so we need to think about these projects seriously and not take, take them um, under consideration without much deep thought. Uh, when I think about mega projects though, we kind of lump them all together and I like to dis, uh, disentangle them into all sorts of different kinds of projects. I developed this more fully in the book, but really quickly here, uh, there's a couple different kinds of mega projects. There's your large expansion projects. There's your remaking projects like the Bay Bridge. Uh, projects can be hybrid projects where they have all different combinations in them. And then I think what's important when we delve into these projects we don't think enough about is the broader context in which they're considered. Um, and I have these terms as unbuilding, unbuilt, and uh, unbuilt. <laughs> uh, and unbuilding projects are those that are uh, being deconstructed, like the takedown of a free freeway. Um, and in the mix are the visions that we have, the unbuilt visions of built projects. Uh, and then also projects that were never built, that we um, that stay in, 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 in a more of a collective memory and sometimes come back uh, into the public discussion. And you're gonna see that in just a moment, uh, clearly with the Bay Bridge. Um, in terms of characteristics for mega projects, I like to call them the seven C's. They're colossal, captivating, controversial, complex, uh, there's issues of control or lack of, um, and there's huge issues with communications. Uh, probably one of them ends up being one of the most important in terms of how we communicate about these projects to the public and particularly to elected officials. Um, in terms of cost estimates, uh, we 
woefully underestimate how much these projects are going to cost. This is research by uh, Professor Bent Fluberg from Oxford University. Uh, he has, with his colleagues, um, um, found that on average, uh, of road projects can have an overrun of at least 20%, bridges and tunnels uh, about 34%, rail at 45%, and, he, and, he's, and he's found that nine out of 10 projects have overruns. So this is a major issue as we build, as we uh, move into these uh, large scale projects. Uh, in terms of the actual use of the demand, those are also uh, poorly estimated too. And he's found that the majority of projects um, in terms of the use, in terms of road and rail, are woefully wrong by at least 25%, 20%. So he quickly summarizes that costs are underestimated and benefits or use are overestimated. And I think we need to keep that particular phrase in our mind as we think about both the Bay Bridge and other mega projects that uh, we're considering or embarking upon, uh, particularly here in the state of California. Um, before I delve into the Bay Bridge, there's five other root issues to consider about why do these projects take so long, why, they, why the costs are so high, uh, is this issue of optimism bias. Uh, this is a research done by um, professor, uh, psychology professor Daniel Kahneman and, and others looking at how we, under, uh, we, are, we are optimistic. We think that we can build these projects um, uh, faster and less expensive and we're just overly optimistic about it. Uh, Professor Flyberg said, no, it's not necessarily optimism bias, instead it's strategic misrepresentation. And it's the purposeful inaccurate reporting of project budgets and travel demand for costs. He says he uses this term instead of lying, um, because lying is, is not so uh, well received as a term. And so my thought is that usually that it's somewhere in between optimism bias and strategic misrepresentation that we can find um, the, the challenges. Uh, we don't often consider the transaction costs of projects. These are the underreported or underestimated costs. Um, I usually focus in on financing. When we focus, when we tell the public about a project, we say it's uh, say six billion dollars or six point five billion, like the Bay Bridge. But when you add in all the financing costs, it ends up potentially being around thirteen billion. And so we need to uncover and expose these uh, transaction costs so the public can have a more serious debate about the delivery of these projects. Uh, we also um, get stuck in these projects, a term called lock-in and path dependence, uh, where we, we approve a project and then we, we can't get out of it. We're stuck in it. <laughs> this happens when we approve the project and down the way when there's project cost increases. Uh, we can't seem to stop the project. It comes up in the Bay Bridge and you'll see it in a moment. Some of the examples are uh, discussions about how we've already put in money or sunk costs, a continuing need to justify the project uh, and not able to change the project once uh, the, the camel's nose is under the tent, so to speak, in terms of moving forward. And, and the last um, that I've, uh, characteristic or issue is the idea of the technological sublime. And this is really writ large in big projects. This goes to the seventh sea of colossal and captivating. Um, and this is um, by Professor uh, David Nye, and he suggests that the, the technological sublime is about the repeated experiences of awe and wonder, often tinged with an element of terror, which people have confronted with, when, when confronted with, uh, sorry, people have had when confronted with particular uh, natural sites, architectural forms, and technological architectural forms and technological achievements, and so really there's this rapture or capture that we have about building these big projects um, that really takes hold. Um, and so the Bay Bridge is an, as a mega project example with personal and professional sublime aspirations of its participants. Um, the five key uh, issues that I mentioned in the seven C's definitely come forward in here and you'll see it throughout my brief uh, discussion about this project. Um, one thing to keep in mind about when you're embarking upon a, a mega project is that past can be prologue, that the long histories that infrastructure has or the long histories of the particular geographic setting come to play in, in, in the project that's under development. Um, so here in the Bay Area, we have a long history and focus on the natural beauty of our San Francisco Bay. But at the same time, we have over, over decades, over the centuries, have been trying to figure out how to cross this massive bay. And so here's an image just of one fellow, uh, Alan C. Rush, who suggested that there should be a crossing from Oakland to San Francisco. Uh, he even envisioned an Eiffel Tower on top of a tower. Uh, and so his own idea of capturing the sublime, that's an interesting feature. Um, I wonder what the engineers in the audience might think about that. Uh, and when the bridge opened in 1936, I'm skipping through so much history, 
um, when the bridge opened in 1960, 1936, there was definitely this idea of the sublime, that this was a bridge that was um, of awe and it was the greatest bridge in the world. On the top left is an image of the, of the bridge. Uh, the, 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 the bridge that actually that we'll be talking about that's replaced is the bridge in the, in the background. That's a cantilever truss span. In the middle is Yerba Buena Island. On the other side is the portion that goes to San Francisco, and that is a standard uh, or a suspension span. But at the time, it was uh, deemed to be the greatest uh, bridge in all of the world. And then it shows in the, in the newspaper article all the small little bridges uh, in comparison. So this idea of comparing bridges and, and, and rivalry. One important note that I think um, for this addition of a bay crossing that we're talking about today is that the original bridge did have rail on the lower deck uh, that was later removed. Um, and no sooner did the Bay Bridge open in 1936 that architects started calling for additional bay crossings. The top image is from an architect, Bernard Maybach, and he's suggesting an, a, a, a second crossing. And then the well-known architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, also called for a second bridge that would also have rail on it, which he called the Butterfly Wing Bridge in 1953. Uh, in the 60s, they took the rail off of the bridge, which, is, which was its own major unbuilding um, project. Uh, and then we fast forward to 1989, and we have uh, an earthquake, um, and the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, and the top deck of the Bay Bridge, which is pictured here, buckled onto the bottom deck. Um, one person was killed, and there's a lot of other devastation in the area. And the question became for the State Department of Transportation, who was Caltrans, what should be done with this bridge? Should it be seismically retrofitted, um, meaning earthquake strengthened, or should it be replaced? And so it took uh, years and years and years for the um, state to do detailed studies. Uh, and in the mid-90s, it decided that it would be more cost effective, or it would be the same cost, but better long term, to actually replace uh, this double-decker bridge uh, with this um, uh, viaduct. Uh, but Caltrans, when they recommended this they, in the state, they knew that the Bay Area probably wouldn't be so pleased with this uh, viaduct uh, uh, because the Bay Area has an idea about design and we have the Golden Gate Bridge um, in our, in our, in our, on our Bay too as a noted international landmark. And so the state of California suggested that if the Bay wanted, the Bay Area wanted a tower, then it could have this uh, two tower cable safe suspension span, uh, but the Bay Area would have to pay that little extra increment of a couple hundred million dollars to be able to deliver uh, this, th this tower. Um, the estimates for the uh, retrofit and the replacement at the time were about the same at $1 billion, and then to add on these towers would be about another 300 million or so. Uh, the detailed costs are all, all in my book. Um, well, you can imagine that the Bay Area wasn't so happy with that two tower cable stay proposal. They were less happy with the viaduct proposal. And so what happened was that there became a multi-year process uh, through five different governors debating on what the project purpose of, of, of this new uh, East Span might be. Uh, and so what happened was um, this whole unleashing of what some people called a, a chaos, some people called it a circus, some people called it public engagement. Um, and that was this idea that um, the public could then make the decision for the design through a particular uh, regional body called the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which is the transportation planning and funding agency for the, the Bay Area's nine counties. Uh, and so the state transferred the decision-making authority over to what's the acronym is the MTC uh, and worked with uh, engineering design and advisory panel. Here's a picture of, of, of a lot of the designers um, making a proposal. You can see the bridge models uh, and the, uh, this process was very closely monitored. It was really well attended in terms of, of outreach and participation. Um, but the state only gave the region nine months to design the uh, proposed the pro the, a, a design um, for the bridge. And I, I don't know about you, for those of you listening in, but nine months is not really a long time to do even a, a, a big scale uh, book report or a, a report, let alone design a bridge of this stature of at least $1 billion. So it wasn't a lot of time. Uh, and it caught the attention of a lot of people, including uh, this fellow, uh, Jason, uh, Jason Meggs. Um, but uh, his name, um, at the time, this picture is Transit Man. And he and others were making the argument that while you build the bridge, you might as well consider 
other options, importantly, bicycle pedestrian access and rail access. And so the Los Angeles Times, uh, looking up at the Bay Area, uh, encaps what I like in this quote is encapsulated the, the, the spirit of, of the time, um, that the bridge is no longer simply a structure that links two of Northern California's biggest cities, a traffic bottleneck, a slow means to an end. In the past 15 months, it has metamorphosed into a visual icon, a gift for the future, a chance to rescue a fragile environment, a landmark that will grace this graceful region into the next century and the one beyond. Uh, and I don't think that when the state and the region embarked upon this project, that they, they, they fully understood how much this would metamorphosis. And I think that that's my message for anybody that's undertaking a mega project is to please check your optimism bias um, and, and how quickly these projects can move forward. Just the history of mega projects is so rife with challenges. Um, what I'd like to do is just quickly delve into two uh, particular areas of issues with respect to the bridge process and how it metamorphosed, and then um, close with some um, recommendations uh, that we can consider and, and, and discuss in the Q&A after Teddy and Kate. I'd first like to talk about uh, discussions about aesthetics, form, and function of the bridge, and then very briefly focus in on the funding and cost increases that the bridge um, process um, or the bridge project uh, had. There's a lot of issues um, with the alignment of the bridge, which I'm not covering here, but it's covered in detail in my book. The key with the alignment, which is important for things like the second or third crossing, is uh, the old real estate adage of location, location, location. Where a bridge or a tunnel um, touches down or, or, or re-enters is critically important in terms of who are the landholders. Um, so to focus in on aesthetics, form, and function, uh, in the 90s, when the bridge was being developed through the regional process, uh, there was this, def this idea that the new bridge had to compete or at least um, equal that of the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, kind of a bridge sibling rivalry. Uh, and so what evolved was a two-step design process in search of the sublime uh, in earthquake country and mud. Uh, the key here is probably many in, in the audience know uh, California's earthquake country. And there's this technical term in the middle of the slide there called bay mud. And, that, <laughs> and that's challenging when you're developing a, a bridge as complex as this is that you need to think about the foundations uh, and that you can't just simply put a tower anywhere you would like because of the, because of the, the mud and, and, and the need to make sure that the bridge is, is secure. Um, in this two-step process, which captured the public and professional sector's imagination, um, one of the first architects to come out um, was a proposal, or excuse me, engineer was the late T.Y. Lin of UC Berkeley, and he proposed a single tower uh, cable stay span. Uh, and then there were a lot of um, people in, in residents in the Bay Area that proposed designs. This is one of my favorite. It's by uh, a graphic artist in the North Bay, Garrett Green. Uh, and he has this idea here of uh, repeating arches across the Bay. Um, and actually the arches are more aesthetic than functional because he was thinking about the low cost of the bridge um, in terms of having that, that wouldn't cost as much as if it were a functional structure. Uh, and so there was a process where they called all these designs together and then they finally hired, uh, the region hired uh, T.Y. Lind International and they went through more of a systematic design process and evaluated uh, what are suspension span alternatives with cable state uh, alternatives. Um, and there's a, there's a difference in terms of their functionality, but aesthetically they look uh, similar, but also uh, different in a way. The suspension span is the same as the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, at the same time, there was a lot of advocacy from the bicycle uh, and rail communities to make sure there was a pathway for uh, people to walk and bicycle across the bridge. Um, lots of challenges with this. People thought, well, why would we, you know, pay for an extra uh, part of the bridge for a bicycle pathway? It's only half of a bridge. Um, but the bicycle and um, other advocates wouldn't let that rest. And so they actually did succeed in getting a pathway included on the bridge. Um, this is the bridge as it was as, as it uh, was um, as it was completed with the old span that was uh, recently just completed in terms of being torn down. So this is the new span that was picked. It was picked be, uh, partly um, for a lot of different reasons, but one of them was it was a, a version of a suspension span to echo the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and but there were became disputes over the problem definition um, and you know the form and the function of the bridge. A lot of um, mayors in, in the East Bay. Uh, thought it was more, it continued to look like a freeway on stilts. The tower was only closest to the island. 
um, and that there were some biases in the competition. And importantly, that there was not rail on the bridge, uh, which they thought that the, um, was needed. Uh, here are some of the leading um, uh, elected officials at the time. Uh, on the left, you have uh, Mayor uh, Willie Brown, uh, Mayor Shirley Dean in the middle, and then, um, and then, uh, then a mayor elect uh, Jerry Brown, who is now our, um, of Oakland, who is now our current governor. Um, they thought the bridge aesthetically needed to be improved. Um, uh, mayor Brown suggested that the right bridge ought to be brought back um, and, for, and for consideration. Uh, mayor Ken Bukowski of, of Emeryville was also a, a key player in this. Uh, and here's uh, Mayor Brown and Mayor uh, Dean um, at, 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 uh, press conference advocating for bikes and rail um, on, on the bridge. Um, and so again, this is about how when you have projects the, between the rail that was taken off and then the right proposal, these things, these ideas of earlier projects or actual infrastructure, they just don't go away and you can't wish them away. And you know that, that um, people might think of them as that these were important um, ideas or infrastructure that we should never have lost in the first place and that we need to bring them back. Um, Really briefly on funding and cost increases, this could be its own uh, webinar, um, but I wanna make sure we have time for Kate and Teddy, um, is the, this chart I did a long time ago, and I think sometimes I'm going to update it, but I kinda like how it looks like it's from another era. <laughs> and that just shows how long this project has been um, front and center in so many of, of, our, of our lives, particularly while it was under construction and we watched that. Uh, but. Uh, Something that people don't think about is that when, when the state was originally um, looking at uh, fixing the bridge, so to speak, it was thinking initially actually about a, retro, a seismic retrofit and the estimate for the entire bridge was 250 million. Um, and then when they made the recommendations to replace the bridge, the bridge, the costs are between 96 and 97 were 1.3 billion. Then it doubled to 2.6 and then it doubled again, or more than that, about that to, at 6.3 billion. Um, in, in 2005. And so there's been this increasing cost escalation um, throughout the life of the project for a variety of reasons. I detailed those uh, quite more um, in my book, but what one to focus in on was uh, this, uh, going back, this cost increase in 2005, um, there was a, a doubling of the actual tower cost. Uh, and we had a change in our governor, uh, governor at the time, and. Um, uh, uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, became um, you know, head, head of office, so to speak. And at this time, when the, when the notice for the tower cost uh, increased, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger um, said that uh, the state should not be responsible for this cost increase. And he actually suggested not including the tower, um, which by the way was already, the foundations of it were already under construction. He suggested instead that there should be a redesign and that the state should look at, and the region should look at either what they call the Skyway or the cable state suspension, or cable state bridge, excuse me. Um, and so that delayed the project about a year. Um, in the end, the, the, cape, the, the, Skyway, uh, the uh, South Lake suspension span was, was ended up being selected just because it really wasn't gonna save a lot of money um, and also because the Bay Area really rallied to maintain keeping um, the, origi the original tower that had been picked in the 90s. And this was, um, 2005-2006 period. Uh, so even once you're under construction, um, sometimes uh, there's things at play where you, you have to stop and, and redesign. Uh, and so here's a picture of Governor Schwarzenegger um, with uh, then uh, Commissioner Sonny McPeak on the right and uh, then Senator Don Parada uh, at the bridge signing key legislation that would allow the bridge to go forward in, in a funding deal uh, that was had. Um, here's a picture of the bridge when it opened. Uh, ideas of the sublime coming forward here with the new iconic San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge is now open and this was in 2013. Um, but as I said, things never quite die. And so, and Teddy and Kate are gonna talk about this more, but now in the Bay Area, um, there's no rail on the, on the new east span. Um, there is the west span of the bridge too, by the way, which also uh, doesn't still have a uh, rail on it and but there's now discussions in the last couple of years that have really elevated to building another bay crossing uh, here's reports by uh, two leading organizations the bay area council and uh, uh, spur san francisco planning and uh, urban and regional research and they're calling for consideration of an additional crossing um, and so in in wrapping so i'd like to wrap up just quickly is that through this uh, political history about the bay bridge 
that you can, I hope you can see that there's been the seven C's um, throughout the process. Um, and the Bay Bridge is not unique. Lots of mega projects have these various C's uh, embedded throughout. Um, after I finished the book, uh, or as I was finishing the book, excuse me, uh, there are these uh, birds that are uh, endangered species and protected, uh, and they're called comorants. And they were on the old bridge and they wouldn't move to the new bridge. Gosh darn those birds. Uh, uh, and so Caltrans uh, had to spend a lot of time and energy moving the birds and extra expense. And the, the birds actually started to delay the actual completion of, of, um, of the demolition of the old, of the old span. Uh, and so I, I named this the eighth C of the seven C. So I, you can always play with more C's uh, if you wanted to. So how in including challenges and confronting. So um, what are ways to confront um, some of these challenges to improve accountability, transparency, cost estimating project management and delivery. I have a couple slides here um, that I'm, I'm not gonna go over every single uh, bullet point, but just to kind of highlight some of them. Uh, and I know these will be up in, they're in, in detail a little bit more in, in the book as well, is um, first, clearly we need to improve cost estimating um, without a doubt, uh, particularly uh, with, based on the work by Professor Fluberg. Um, we could think about including, and I highly recommend more detailed transaction cost analyses. Uh, we need to discuss um, financing and have uh, full disclosure that these projects, that they're not, that well, yes, we're, we're raising tolls perhaps, we're, we're finding, we're using other monies, but we're bonding against those revenues um, and that there's increased costs with that. Um, with this project and with lots of other projects, sometimes risk analysis is not actually included from the beginning. Uh, and we need to include risk analysis. Uh, we also need to do something called, um, it's a fancy term here called reference class forecasting, um, but that's just simply finding other projects that are similar or similar enough and um, comparing the costs of one project to another, uh, which might be done in the cost estimating, but it's not made public. And it's not necessarily discussed with the elected officials that are making the decisions so that this can kind of break down some of the optimism bias. And then finally, um, one thing um, is we often present our cost estimates even to the third decimal point, which creates an error, a, a level of false precision uh, that we, with these projects, and it'd be, it would be much uh, better, I think, for public consumption uh, and elected officials and others if these were provided more in ranges, um, and even maybe, you know, best case and worst case scenario ranges. Um, secondly, I recommend uh, that we need to improve our project management and delivery from the onset. Uh, Kate and Teddy will talk a little bit more about this, but there's not standard uh, regular external independent peer review before a project begins um, often. Uh, so I recommend that. Uh, we need to spend more time building the public sector capacity because um, a lot of projects are e either built by the private sector and as we move towards public-private partnerships, um, the public sector needs to better, far better understand what the private sector does, what its motives are, um, and, and, and it just its, its, its operating practices um, to help improve some of the oversight and contract writing. Um, and we need to also look for some of the successes in government so we can learn from those. Uh, because I'm sure there are successes, and if you have any, I would love to know those because the big uh, blind spot that we have in mega project scholarship is uh, not having so many so much coverage of the, of the better practices. It's much easier to take apart the, 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 the less than best. And then finally, I'd like to wrap up by spending just a moment on process and project history. Um, we need to consider the uh, path dependence and project histories, um, the, the mega projects typology that I mentioned at the beginning in terms of unbuilding and more. Those, 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 those ideas just don't go away, as I said. And we need to include the time and space for considering the technological sublime and considering um, what the state was then calling amenities. That was bike, uh, the bicycle pathway and rail. And I think that one day's uh, amenities or one, one past amenities can be a future generation's perceived necessities. And I think we're seeing that now with the debates about whether or not to pursue a second crossing or third crossing on the bay. Um, we need to build in time for collaborative public processes um, on problem definition. The Bay Bridge was only nine months um, originally, it, it took a lot longer. And then finally, um, we need to build in multi-way communications. Um, I don't, 
um, often communications budgets are a tiny portion of a large infrastructure project and they should be significantly more so that people are, are well informed and able to engage in a two-way or multi-way conversation throughout the project particularly as it heads into um, lumps and bumps <laughs> so to speak um, so with that, I'd like to thank um, Transportica and Island Press and so many others for this opportunity and turn it over to uh, Kate and Teddy. All right. Uh, thank you, Karen, uh, for that lovely presentation. It's always great to, to see what um, our old advisors are up to. So as, as she mentioned or uh, briefly hinted at, I'm going to start by discussing a little bit of UC Berkeley Department of City and Regional Planning's 2016 Fall Transportation Studio. And so Kate and I are really only going to touch on maybe two of the six or seven topics that the entire studio covered over the course of, of that fall. And if uh, people are interested, the website is still live. And last I checked, all the links work. Um, and so what this was, were, were 15 students spanning uh, many different disciplines within the Department of City and Regional Planning, from transportation to housing to healthy cities, as well as public health students and engineers. And so we, we came together kind of as a mini consulting firm to tackle a, a mega project in a mega region, which is the uh, a third crossing of the bay. And so just to give a very brief recent history of the, of the third crossing, um, it, as Karen mentioned, it has existed since the 1950s before there was even a second crossing people were thinking about a second Bay Bridge, and now now we're thinking about a second BART tube or a second um, Trans Bay crossing. And I don't mean to to poke fun at San Francisco right now, but we're hoping that the term third crossing might might pick up a little bit, given that the Trans Bay in recent weeks has not had the greatest press. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just search San Francisco Trans Bay Terminal, and, and you'll quickly find out. But the, the discussion of a third crossing really revamped in earnest when MTC, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, released their core capacity study. And so what they were focusing on in that were ways in the near, medium, and long term to relieve congestion in the region's core, which is really downtown San Francisco. So both of the worst car commutes in the region are either to or from downtown San Francisco, and the most congested rail segment is also to downtown San Francisco. And so this presents a really pressing need in the near and long-term future for leaving that and making sure that the Bay Area stays a competitive region. So once MTC released that, um, there were a few more thoughtful, you know, global and regional entities that came to the table. So SPUR, which is a transportation advocacy organization released a report as well as the Bay Area Council and McKinsey released a report as well that was really kind of visionary and and looked at how this project might be done in five years or less and I don't want to play spoiler but we're two years down the line and inching towards the project so we might be a bit further than five years. In the fall of 2016 the studio embarked upon this project and we we covered a lot of different topics from potential railway alignments, different types of technology that could be used. Um, BART has its own rail gauge, so whether it be BART or a commuter rail system. We looked at how to fund and finance this project, how to bring together a successful governance structure to deliver it, as well as uh, many other sort of co-benefits as we described them. And a lot of the feedback that we got from the stakeholders in the region was that it was really sort of excellent that we had taken the time to focus on on the equity aspects of this bridge or not bridge of, of a third crossing and really for whom it's being constructed and transform released a report that was similar to that but sort of building on the the feedback that we got kate myself and our other studio colleague travis Rissards. Uh, produced a report specifically about the third crossing and health equity. 
So what we're going to do today is I'm going to discuss a little bit about the next steps given where we are in the process. And Kate's going to, going to give a brief overview of what we were doing um, with the health equity report, all in service of you know, potential third crossing sometime and hopefully in this century. So there are two main aspects of where we are now. BART has actually received the funding that they need to begin preliminary engineering studies and they are releasing RFPs, certainly for the study and potentially for the initial phases of construction itself relatively soon. And so now is a really key point to think about who is going to be studying this crossing because that's intricately intertwined with what they will be studying. BART owns and operates the BART system, so it's no surprise that they'll be looking at a BART alternative, but given the growing size of this mega region, we believe that it also makes sense to look at what, what a different type of rail crossing might look like. So we're gonna go briefly into that and, and think about all the stakeholders and parties that are touched by this project. So, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with the Bay Area, BART is our uh, commuter rail service, for lack of a more specific term, that's both above and below ground and touches the majority of the nine counties. And the Transbay tube is a very old piece of infrastructure that BART knows it needs to revamp. And so they are obviously studying that. And in addition to the resilience benefits of having redundancy across this bay, a BART alternative really does address the most pressing needs of the next 10 to 15 years. BART is already overcrowded and with, if regional growth projections hold, it will just continue to become more overcrowded and force people onto the streets which are you know, crowded themselves. And so this idea of, of what we call standard rail or something more along the lines of an Amtrak or a Caltrain alternative, Caltrain being the passenger rail service that operates south of San Francisco to Silicon Valley are exciting. The, the Transbay terminal has space for a high speed rail connection. And so there, there are talks of this opportunity for someone to get on a train in Sacramento and be in Silicon Valley, you know, within 45 minutes, which is really unheard of today. And this would alleviate some of the pressing concerns in San Francisco, but wouldn't really directly address just the core capacity. It, it does reshape the region a bit into a mega region and would then shift our thinking about what the core is as well. And so these are, this is obviously a major decision point. And we know for now that BART is moving forward with a BART only alternative. Additionally, there are, there are sort of five other key topics that we think are decision points beyond which there is really no going back. And four of them are gonna be handled by whoever is actually looking at this project. And one of them, you know, echoing what Professor Trappenberg Frick said a little while ago, we really believe should fall into the hands of an external entity. And so on the top are you know, things that one would usually see in, in this type of engineering endeavor. And then on the bottom half of that slide, is something that we feel is really quite important. And that's not only a technical project oversight, but community project oversight, because the Bay Area has a long history of really doing harm to specific communities with transportation investment. And something on the scale of this project, no one's gonna put a dollar figure to it, and neither are we, but it, it's in the ballpark of the Bay Bridge, really has the opportunity to to start to rectify some of those past ills. And now, really now is the time to set up that advisory board. Touching just a bit on risks as well, you know, Karen mentioned the Bay Mud and that presents really interesting engineering challenges for the production of the tube. And interestingly also means that there's no cost benefit from pursuing a BART and a standard gauge rail option in the same tube. So this, we could potentially be looking at a third and a fourth crossing, you know, given, given the current environment. Obviously funding and financing are, are big question marks these days. You know, every week is infrastructure week, but, but also no week is infrastructure week. And 
and the structure of our financing is, is being reformed uh, for better or worse, depending upon who you talk to. But I think the key takeaway from that is we're really moving as a country towards a more local and regionally funded transportation and other infrastructure world. And there is a really large question of how, how the region can come up with that type of money given the current state of things. Um, yeah. Again, I touched a bit earlier on who's most impacted by this project. Sorry. And I'm going to go just a bit into governance structure as well here. You know, what are, what are the risks of putting together some sort of powers authority that, that has the purview to really get this done? And something else that we, we heard during the studio report was this delicate balancing act between, you know, a siloed view of this link as part of BART only or part of some other mode only versus going too holistic and having all of the 27, 28 now transit operators in the Bay Area involved in this because they would be impacted. And there's, there's some happy medium in the middle and I'm not sure in this country or in any other if we have really a tremendous number of great examples of a multimodal authority that can bring about projects in a timely and cost-effective manner. So this is something that I'm gonna walk through a very simple example of the way we tried to reason through who should be involved in this and how quickly it gets quite complex. So when, when those of us who were working on the governance section of the studio started to think about, okay, you know, who should be at the table here? We, we had to separate things by those who are critical and those who are impacted. And these can be stakeholders, individuals, or communities. And so obviously critical parties are the potential future operators. And BART, we've, we've talked about. And the other player here is uh, the Cal State Transportation Agency. And if a standard rail alignment is to be pursued, they become increasingly important given the regional and state impacts of such a critical Amtrak rail link. One of the other things that we, we talked about was this hope that this project could be used as a catalyst for some regional consolidation of transit operators in the Bay Area. Obviously this doesn't exist yet, but we're starting to see some true fare integration with the clipper card and were some sort of multimodal authority to be developed, they would obviously be critical as well. Karen mentioned location, location, location. And we, we happen to know that BART is pursuing options that are going to be parallel to their existing service, but not duplicative, which means that there's a tremendous amount of land that's going to need to be acquired to bring this project to fruition. And so that touches on Union Pacific's current rail alignments potentially the city of Alameda and the Navy base that's out there, as well as the city of Oakland and a lot of private land in the city of San Francisco as well. So all of these people are going to need to come to the table too, because they'll have to make significant concessions for this project to become a reality. And the last batch of critical input or is critical input. Obviously MTC is important here, having been involved in all of the regions, large transportation projects. This, this idea of a community advisory board touches back to that external oversight that I had discussed earlier. And then there are these really thoughtful and often innovative you know, think tanks and advocacy organizations in the Bay Area that, you know, whose voices deserve to be heard. Now, when we think about those people who might be impacted, we get all of the other operators in the Bay Area, particularly SFMTA, who would be operating directly above this, Caltrain, AC Transit, Capital Corridor, everyone who lives here. And, you know, I could have put 15 more logos up there, but the, the idea of this is to communicate that even the simple task of trying to understand who should be involved on in this project and who makes sense to lead it really gets complicated quite quickly. And so, it's really important to keep in mind that you know, 
those who are doing studying really affect the outcome of the project. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kate to, to dig back into kind of this community advisory board public side of it and think about the health equity impacts of such a large and potentially transformative project. Thanks, Teddy. So in the, um, in the studio, we looked at a number of potential impacts that the ferry crossing is going to have on the, um, the Bay Area community and um, on the regional authorities. The one that we heard was uh, the most um, unique and important issue that we were focusing on was looking at the health impact or the health equity impacts of a third crossing because um, in explicit inclusion of equity and specifically health equity are often absent from planning processes on transportation projects other than if they're legally mandated. Um, and then this is particularly re relevant for larger transportation infrastructure projects, um, which can have a huge potential to transform an entire region and can have significant direct and inter indirect public health impacts. Um, so when I'm going to go over um, what health equity is, the concept of health equity comes from the public health field, and this field evaluates health impacts of the overall pep population, and then also specifically focuses on the need of, needs of vulnerable populations. So I'm going to show two different approaches to how public health interventions impact populations and the theories around how to focus health, public health interventions. So this figure um, represents the hypothetical distribution of a health risk in a population before and after a population-wide health intervention. The shift of the population distribution curve to the left after the intervention demonstrates that if a change to an exposure that affects the entire population is made within a given society, some people will still experience high levels of risk, but everyone's risk will be reduced and ultimately fewer people will suffer from the negative health exposures related to this risk. So then the next um, curve that we're going to look at is um, comes from Frolic and Potvin's theory of um, health equity and vulnerable communities. And they argue that because health gains from actual interventions are not distributed evenly across entire populations, as the theory depicted in the last figure I showed, focusing only on a shift in the overall population results in magnifying disparities in health between vulnerable populations at the far right end of the health distribution curve and those in the middle of the bell curve. Figure two, so this one on the screen, demonstrates this theory and highlights how those on the right end of the distribution experience a concentration of health risk and those on the left end of the distribution experience a concentration of health benefits. Often health opportunities and burdens associated with transportation are not distributed equitably and dis disproportionately affect low-income communities and communities of color. For instance, residents in West Oakland living near the Port of Oakland, multiple freeways, and the existing San Francisco Bay Bridge, and the potential um, location of a third crossing are exposed to three times more diesel particles than the rest of the Bay Area, and have some of the highest regional rates of emergency department visits due to asthma. So we took this um, health equity approach, um, Frelick and Potvin's approach, where um, we recognize that some populations are at a higher risk and we therefore need to target health interventions that um, specifically address the health risks of those who are in those populations. And then we looked at health equity issues and opportunities related to four categories that a third crossing would impact. So we looked at um, regional accessibility, housing costs, gentrification, and indirect residential displacement due to um, developing a third crossing and the, um, 
the increased housing costs and um, changes in um, land use related to that development. Then we also looked at access to social services. So um, using a, there's an opportunity to use the um, the new development um, to cluster community relevant services and improve access to social services for those who are transit dependent. And then we also looked at opportun employment opportunities related to the third crossing. So when we look at the health impacts related to regional accessibility um, that could come from a transportation infrastructure project similar to the third crossing, um, we know that traffic related air pollution exposure is associated with respir respiratory disease, cancer and cardiovascular disease and changes to commute time are associated with um, impact with impacts related to active activity levels and obesity rates. Land use and land value changes related to the development of an infrastructure project like a third crossing can lead to increased housing costs and residential displacement within the project area. So one study that we found um, showed that families who have been displaced in the Bay Area are more likely to experience some form of homelessness after being displaced and often move to areas that have higher health and safety concerns and fewer healthcare facilities. Then we also found that people's commutes are, off, are also often longer and they are more likely to rely on vehicles to commute after being displaced. Transportation infrastructure projects like a third crossing also potentially positively or negatively impact access to social services. So improved access to social services like health services can establish a stronger link between healthcare providers and patients and increase preventative care services. And increased access to affordable grocery stores, education centers, and rec recreational facilities are also associated with better physical and mental health outcomes. Finally, transportation infrastructure projects like a third crossing can create a lot of jobs during the planning, building, and operation phases of the project. Um, so access to stable employment is associated with improved physical and mental health outcomes and increased access to employment amongst parents also lead to positive and negative health outcomes for their children. There's a lot of other health equity impacts that transportation projects um, of this size can have. And we've written a uh, um, paper on this that you can find on the Third Crossing website. Um, and you can also feel free to email Teddy or I for more, if you have more questions about this. So we know that the third crossing will impact regional accessibility, housing availability, access to services and employment for a large proportion of people in the Bay Area. Um, and based on the theories that I presented at the beginning of um, this, of my short presentation, we want to focus on how the third crossing could have the strongest positive impact on health and outcomes for populations who are at a risk of negative health outcomes related to transportation, land use, and access to services. We developed a number of strategies that can be taken when planning, building, and operating a third crossing that focuses on positively impacting the health outcomes of those most at risk. And we've grouped them into the same four categories. A few strategies that we could use to improve regional accessibility for communities who are most at risk of experiencing negative health outcomes related to developing a new crossing include increasing bus service to connecting underserved communities during peak and off peak hours, guaranteeing that the third crossing will provide overnight service, which is really critical um, and is definitely that's, some, that's something that Transform has been um, very adamant about and um, that I'd love to talk about further. Um, and then also developing an equitable um, regional transit fare structure and providing discounted bridge tolls for low income motorists, um, which we can also, it, that one's a little bit controversial and I'd also really like to talk about that if 
um, and he would like to bring it up in the question and answer period. Strategies that could be used to address increasing housing costs and indirect residential displacement for communities who are most at risk of experiencing negative health outcomes related to displacement caused by the third crossing include providing incentives for cities with existing and new rail transit stations to adopt rent st stabilizing and just rent stabilization or just cause eviction ordinances because the um, land costs near rail transit um, do increase significantly as a lot of research has shown. Um, and we also suggest that providing incentives to cities with existing and new rail transit stations to adopt policies that expedite the review process for affordable housing could also um, positively impact health outcomes for those at risk. Um, so some strategies that could be used to increase access to social services for communities who are most at risk of experiencing reduced access to services caused by the third crossing include developing new and existing transit stations into hubs of support services, including education, healthcare, and social services, or establishing rider to provider programs to further extend access to these new hubs. Finally, strategies that could be used to increase employment opportunities related to the third crossing to those who are underemployed in the Bay Area include offering training for skilled and technical positions created by the project. So this includes uh, the development of the project as well as um, transit operators or um, the main maintenance um, people who are maintaining the bridge. Um, and then also establishing ban the box fair or fair chain um, fair chance hiring policies for jobs created by the project and establishing affordable workplaces for low and, mo and moderate wage jobs in developments that result from a project like this. Um, so that's all for us. Um, thank you, and we do recognize that this presentation probably raises a lot more questions than it answers. Um, but I think that that is the stage that we're in right now. Um, and we've identified some key questions and decision making process points that um, Teddy's talked a lot about. Um, and here are a couple other questions that we um, think that need to be considered um, by decision makers as well as by the general public in the Bay Area when thinking about this project. Um, there, we also want to recognize the people who are in this studio who are now off doing some pretty amazing, wonderful things and still supporting this project in many ways. Um, and David Ori and a number of um, review, reviewers and interviewer interviewees um, from two years ago and um, more recently for this project. Um, there's also sources to a number of the public health statistics and findings that I reviewed on this slide. And if you'd like more information, um, you can visit the website or email Teddy or I. Um, I think we can move into Oh yeah, I'm going to go back to the website so you can visit the web page if you like. Um, there it is, thirdcrossing.org. Um, if you, I guess we can move into question and answer period. Hi, this is Greg Justice. I wanted to first thank you so much for this presentation. This is quite amazing. Um, it, it just incredibly detailed. I've read the report. It is, I would say, transformational. It's just, again, something that I hope a lot of uh, political leaders will actually consider moving forward with that. Um, I'm just curious if, let's say, there were a... Um, 
going forward, if there happens to be BART only on the third crossing, do you ever think there's a potential of reintroducing rail onto the current bridge? So literally maybe closing down one of the lanes and putting rail back onto that. Uh, Greg, that's a, that's a, a great question that um, I, I am in, in the studio. I, I asked us, the studio to take a look at because um, it, it always comes up uh, and um, we, we explored it just a little bit, but there just wasn't really an interest in taking, not, not necessarily by our studio, but in talking to the, uh, 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 some of the key officials. I think the idea of taking a lane is uh, to use another tra to use a transportation pun is like the third rail. Um, it's just too controversial. It, it really becomes a turf issue of, of the, whether this should be for cars or for trains, and just this thing is just too much of a political hot potato to even consider. Um, there's there's other issues with it, but um, the main one I think is a, is a political one. There's engineering and design issues clearly, but. Uh, it, it really wasn't a, 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 a non a thing, something not even to really be explored. I, I, that's sad to me because it, I mean, a historically, rail was on the bridge, but I, you know, in many cities, including San Francisco, Sacramento, where you do have uh, rail transportation sharing tracks with uh, you know standard vehicle traffic, I would think that would be an opportunity to. Um, combine maybe the not just not the carpool lane but an actual bus lane uh, and maybe bus rapid transit lane. Oh, so, uh, for, so for a bus, I was thinking about rail, Greg. Excuse me. For there have been and recently, I believe it might have even been in the MTC core capacity study, a look at a contraflow lane, which would be a reverse lane that could be a bus lane in either direction. Um, I was thinking about in the context of the rail lane. I'm not sure for a bus lane um, what. Um, what the consider what you know if that's a that that also has a huge political issues but I'm not I'm not actually sure if that's um, a, a no go so to speak I was thinking about it from a rail perspective although in in some ways it's the same in terms of taking a lane um, but just rail lane rail rail lane would be so much a rail service would be just so much more expensive I think also on the the bus issue. MTC identified that the, the bridge itself is not necessarily the bottleneck. It's all of the um, intertwined approaches to the bridge that really slow the buses down. And so they're investigating alternate ways to get yeah. the buses onto the bridge right. where they actually travel at a relatively good speed. And there's an extra um, service tunnel of sorts through East Bay Mud, I think that, that's uh, in, in, inoperable at the moment that they're exploring. Other questions? Hi, I was wondering if you guys could talk more about the controversy regarding discounted bridge tolls for disadvantaged communities. Hi, this is Kate. Can I ask who is, um, who asked the question? Oh yes, my name is Marta Polovin and I'm a student in Karen's class. <laughs> oh great. Um, yeah, so Hi, Marta. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, so there's been a lot of research that has found that low income individuals were more likely to find employment when they had consistent access to an automobile compared to when they only had access to transit. Um, and even when they were living in dense metropolitan areas like the Bay Area. Um, so there has been a lot of work to try to think of innovative ways to make um, automobile access to low income individuals more accessible and um, have that be, um, be a positive impact on their ability to find employment. Um, so a lot of that work has been done by Blumenberg and Pierce um, at UCLA. Um, so I'd suggest looking at more of their work. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? We don't have any questions online. Uh, 
I'm going to ask one as well. Has there ever been, I mean, uh, Bart's gauge is unique, um, engineering wise, quite unfortunate, but has there any, ever been any other transit project like this where two gauges are integrated or possibly integrated? Not as far as we know. Um, and it was an interesting finding that I believe ERA or AECOM, one of the large engineering firms discovered that there's, there's really no benefit to combining them. And they recommended almost that it would be better to have two separate pieces of infrastructure for each. Um, I'm racking my brain right now, but I don't, I don't think there's anywhere that the two different gauge rail share the same infrastructure. Are there any other questions coming forward? I don't have any online or on Twitter. All right, well, on that note, again, we thank you very much for the presentation. This is something that is incredibly important. Um, such a very, you know, high value discussion warrants further attention and we're hoping a lot more people see this on YouTube as well. This is an issue that is just getting bigger by the moment. Um, and definitely so many players to be involved. And we are very thankful that uh, you folks in the class has actually created this report. This is something that's very wonderful to read, very easy to read. So I hope more people download the report and partake of it. So again, on behalf of Island Press, Cal Green, and Transportica, I want to thank all three presenters today. Dr. Karen Truppenberg Trapp Frick, uh, Teddy Forscher, and Kate Beck, all of UC Berkeley. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Thanks thank you. Us. All right. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day. <laughs>